Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our class today, the Invasive Upland Plant Management for Solid Waste Facilities. Um, my name is Tara Albert, and I will be your solid waste operator trainer for the state of New Hampshire and your coordinator for today's class. Before we get going, we do have a few things that we need to go over, some logistics and how, housekeeping. Um, before, so just to orient you to your toolbar, some of you have a toolbar that looks like this, others have one that looks a little bit different. Um, if you do need to minimize it, you have this uh, orange rectangle here with the white arrow and you can minimize your toolbar. You can also raise your hand by using the raise hand function. So you put your hand up and you can put your hand down. Uh, if you do have a question while we're going through the presentations, please feel free to send us questions. Um, you have a little question toolbar here. You will toggle that down um, and you can ask questions to the presenter. Also in this class, there are three handouts. Um, those are in the handout section, again, near the question toolbar. There is one that says handouts. There's not one in this picture, but there is one on your toolbar. Um, so you can send those. If you are having some technology issues, if you're on VPN, you can disconnect and then come back into the webinar. Make sure that you have that link so you can connect. If you're not quite sure what a VPN is, you're probably not on one, so you don't have to worry about it. If you do have audio issues, you can use the audio um, section on your toolbar, which will say audio, and you'll have three different options here. Uh, if your computer is not working, you can go to phone call and you can call in and you will be given an audio pin when you come in. Okay few other housekeeping issues. Make sure that you stay hydrated today. It's kind of a cool day. It's not so hot, but stay hydrated. And if you do use a single use container, please recycle it. Thank you. Um, usually in this place in the presentation, we talk about if you need to get up and take a break, if you need to use the restrooms, please feel free to do so. However, I do know when you have walked away from your computer. I have a little toolbar that shows me if someone's not paying attention. So make sure you come back. Um, also, make sure you're muted. In this workshop today, everyone starts out as muted. There will be a couple of opportunities where we can unmute you and you can ask questions if you want to verbally ask your question. Just make sure that when you are done with that, you mute yourself back. Emergency exits, I'm obligated to tell you to look for your emergency exits. This is, of course, not my door. However, it is a very pretty door. Uh, just make sure if you if there is an emergency throughout the day, please feel free to leave if you have to. Let me know that you um, what your plan is for coming back and watching the class, whether it's the recorded session or if you've hopped back in. Um, just communicate with me what the um, your emergency was. Okay. So throughout the day, we will be posting polls, and that is one way that I can collect different types of information from you, and we can also garner attendance. Uh, to show you what that is, we're going to do a practice poll right now. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to answer that question. How many people are attending the class with you? Now, for those of you who have more than one person attending with you under your registration, you will need to do a separate um, sign-in sheet for those folks who have, are not physically registered. There is a sign-out sample in the handout section of this presentation. You can feel free to print that out or you can create your own. It is up to you. Give you guys a couple more seconds. Okay. Voted. So, and then this is what it'll look like when we share the poll results. So most of you are in just you. There are a few of you who are either one or two more people or three or four more people. Make sure for those of you who are in those 17% and the 4% that you are doing the, the handout. If you have questions about that, let me know and I can check in with you when I am done presenting. Okay. 
So taking attendance, haha, you're probably wondering how we're going to take attendance. We do see, of course, who's registered, who's physically signed in, and the computer tells us who is actively listening and who's walked away from their computer for an hour. Uh, we will be submitting poll questions. You just saw one. Um, they, those poll questions will have a time limit so we can see who's engaged and who's paying attention. If there are multiple people in the room with you, we will account for that. Again, sign in sheets. And I know I've said this three times now. There is a reason why I repeat myself because I get the question all the time. Well, how do I do that? How do I show I attended? And I'm going, I told you in the class, do your sign in sheets. Um, and so we ask that you submit those with your renewal form and a copy of it has to go with each renewal form. All right. An email will also go out either right after this class or within 24 hours with a survey and an evaluation. Please be truthful in your assessment of the class, but also be kind. Um, also, the response is not anonymous. Uh, so we do see who is sending what on your, on your review. A couple more logistics for the day. Um, in this class, there are no videos, so you don't have to worry about um, finding another place to watch videos for this class. So the first part we can kind of ignore. Um, we will take a quick Q&A break after each presentation. So if you've got questions, you can type those in. Um, we also do have the ability to unmute you if typing, if we're not getting whatever the question is that you have. We will still take 15 minute break about halfway through the presentation. And we're recording this as well. So no pressure on that. All right. So the class that we are posting today is Invasive Upland Plant Management for Solid Waste Facilities. So if that is why you're here, awesome. If you are here for a different class, feel free to stay and attend this one. It's going to be a great class today. One answer to the question of why you're here is because you have to be. You're required by um, law and New Hampshire solid waste rule to take at least two and a half hours of training each day for your solid waste operator training. You also wanna build your resume and accumulate professional development hours. This class specifically though, is a bit different than what we usually talk about in solid waste operator training. This one talks about invasive species that could be growing at your facility or that are being brought to your facility from your customers. Um, so it is a little different and it's gonna be a fun class today because this is one that I um, will be learning along with you guys. So what are we gonna cover? We are gonna talk about what are the invasive species? Why are they considered invasives? What are the eight species most likely to be brought in or to establish at a solid waste facility in New Hampshire? We're gonna talk about management options for controlling um, facilities, whether they were established or they're spread. Also how to manage invasives at active facilities or on the cap of closed landfills. So we are gonna be focusing on those closed landfills at the end of the day too, which is something that we don't always focus on. Uh, and then we'll have questions, resources, and a wrap up. But before I bring on our main presenter for the day, we do have a pre-workshop test just to see um, what you guys do know and we're gonna gauge what you've learned throughout the day. So our first pre-workshop poll is, the following are upland plant invasive species found in New Hampshire. So choose all that you think apply. And we are not going to go over the answers now. We will go over them at the end of the day, but I'll show you what people have put um, for their answers. You guys are quick today. I'm trying to do that 90% and then we'll show you. All right. So we've got Japanese knotweed at 92%. 72% is milfoil, 68% burning bush, 52% barberry, and 48% wisteria. Our next question is, which management method should you never do with an invasive species? Choose all that apply.
we're getting answers all over the board, but there's one that's jumping way out ahead of everybody else. <laughs> Give you guys a couple more seconds. So we have 96% people said com don't compost it, 46 don't burn it, 8% said don't cover it, 4% don't dig it up, and 21% said chem chemical application. So how do invasive species spread from location to location? Choose all that apply. There's one in here that's kind of a trick answer. All right, so 100% said seeds via vectors. 60% said nursery, selling them as pretty plants. 92% uh, said compost, and 72% said incomplete burns. This is just an easy true or false. Invasive plants brought to a solid waste facility from a customer should be treated as leaf and yard waste. True or false? I think this one gets a record for the number of people that voted. Holy mackerel. 21 seconds, and 100% of you said false. Great. All right, so that is our pre-post poll questions. Now I am going to introduce Dr. Marr. She is going to be our presenter for the day, and I'm also going to change presenter and ask her to bring up her presentation on the screen while I'm doing that. So Dr. Marr received her PhD in environmental studies at Antioch University, New England in 2021 after researching the long-term effects of non-native forest Oh, my screen went crazy, sorry. Disease, white pine blister, ru blister rust on New Hampshire's white pine population. She has been a researcher and project leader for Antioch Center for Climate Preparedness and Community Resilience with a focus on strengthening community resilience to severe weather events impacted by climate change. Ooh, we might tap you to talk on our uh, extreme weather events class. She is also an adjunct faculty member in the Environmental Studies Department and co-teaches a wildlife and forestry management course where invasive species and their effects on wildlife habitats are a topic for discussion. Janine has also served as the chair for the Gilsom Conservation Commission where she assisted the Nature Con Conservancy with the acquisition of the town's largest unfragmented land parcel, 1,368 acres, for our permanent conservation and protection. And as a member of the Conservation Commission and an advanced master gardener, Dr. Marr has presented on invasive species impacts in natural landscapes to a variety of audiences. So Janine, let me check. We've got your presentation. We have you, we can hear you. I'm gonna go ahead and turn my microphone and my camera off and let you go. If we have any questions, um, I will let you know. And then uh, you let me know if you've got any questions for me. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Tara. And I'm really excited that everybody decided that uh, invasive species should not be considered yard waste. <laughs> It gets us off to a really good place. So uh, thank you and welcome everybody to this presentation. And as Tara said, if you have any questions as I go along, please put them in the chat. And she's gonna be monitoring the chat for me while I'm speaking. If I don't touch upon your um, question in my presentation, we'll make sure to talk about it when we have a, a bit of a break. Um, I am gonna be talking about invasive upland plants, not water plants how to identify them, um, how to manage for them, and um, see if I can actually get the screen to be moving here. Um, and some of the object uh, objectives for this particular class uh, at the end, I'm hoping that you'll have a better understanding of why some of these plants are considered invasive by law in New Hampshire, 
that you'll be able to describe how their presence may impact our native ecosystems and communities, that you will be able to identify at least five of the most common invasive species that um, might be disposed of at your facility or become established at your facility, and also have an idea of at least three different ways that you can attempt to control, eradicate, or manage for invasive species should they show up at your facility. As Tara said earlier, we're breaking this uh, workshop into two sections. One, to identify invasive species, understand why they're considered invasive, and sp specifically look at eight species uh, that top the list. We'll take a break, and then we'll go into the management piece and talk about how to get rid of the species, how to control their populations, and then Tara will talk to you specifically about what you're allowed to do at the active solid waste facilities and then on the cap of closed landfills. And again, any questions that you have, please put them in the chat. We'll try to pause in a couple of points in this presentation for you to be asking questions. So we're going to start off with a couple of definitions. And New Hampshire has a definition for alien species which is any species including the eggs, the seeds, the spores, and any other parts that are capable of reproducing that species that is not native to that ecosystem. So in New Hampshire and in North America um, and in the Northeast, species that are not native that are considered alien include the lilac, the Physithia, and even the apple. They're not native to this region. We also have a definition in New Hampshire for um, invasive species. Those are alien species whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. So that's the difference between an alien species like a lilac that can grow next to some dogwoods, um, pine trees, other native plants, and really not pose any problems to those other native plants and communities. An invasive species is very greedy as far as nutrients, as far as space, and can go as far as to alter the chemical makeup of the soil, the temperature of the soil, um, and try to take over the space, crowding out native species, killing them out, and just taking over the landscape. So very, very detrimental to native communities. That's the biggest difference. New Hampshire has a prohibited invasive species rules. Um, no person shall collect, transport, import, export, move, distribute, propagate, or transplant any living and viable um, portion of any plant species, including the, the newest cultivars, the hybrids that maybe have prettier flowers, which means more seed, um, a better growing habit, none of that that is on the New Hampshire Prohibited Invasive Species list. That list came out in 2004. It now has 35 different plants on it. If you want to see the actual list, the URL at the bottom of the screen is a place that you can go, um, whether it's now or through the PDF version of this later on. Um, I tried to put URLs throughout this presentation, so if you want more information, you've got a place to go. Persons shall be exempt from collecting and transporting living and viable prohibited invasive species for the purposes of disposal. You are allowed to collect and transport as long as the purpose is to dispose of. However, you must ensure that the viable living parts, seeds, propagules do not escape. So if somebody, Joe Schmo, is out there cutting down the burning bush today, it's all covered with berries and it's bright red and he doesn't want it in the yard anymore, he throws it on the back of the pickup truck with the tailgate down, drives it to your facility to put it in the yard waste. Um, well, you know, I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm trying to dispose of it. So that's legal, right? Well, you cannot guarantee that pieces of the plant did not escape on that trip to the solid waste facility that the seeds didn't blow out, drop out, whatever, that's a problem. And a lot of homeowners don't understand 
that when they do transport, they have to guarantee that nothing, um, nothing is dropped along the way to the facility. So what makes a non-native species actually invasive in habit? There's three key points, and if these are the only three points that you remember today, you're doing really, really well. These are really, really key points. An invasive species can adapt to a wide range of conditions, whether it's climate, soil, the sun, the chemicals in the soil, the um, plants that are, are around it, the wind, the, the weather extremes, and they also can thrive on disturbed sites. And part of the reason is that they grow really quickly. They don't have any competition around them. They can quickly just come up out of nowhere and take over an open space. They also have the ability to outcompete native vegetation, partially because of the heavy seed production. Um, they produce a lot more seeds than native plants do through a process called layering. And layering is when a branch touches the ground and it forms roots where it touches the ground and all of a sudden you have a new plant. Uh, through a process called nitrogen fixation. And there are certain invasive species that have these little nodules. They look like little, um, little round peas almost, but tinier that are attached to the roots and the purpose of those little nodules is to absorb nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it over into um, a means that the plant can use. So it's sort of like a plant has found a way to create its own fertilizer. And by having that extra nitrogen, it has more ability to create more top growth because nitrogen is what you need for your top growth, your leaves and your stems that gives it um, a competitive edge over native plants that don't have that ability. Another really important um, ability that native uh, invasive species have uh, is called allelopathy. And um, invasive species can send out chemicals through the roots or the rhizomes below the ground that um, force other plants to either move out of the area or actually kill the other plants. It's a chemical that's poisonous to a lot of other plants. Um, black walnut is one of those. If you ever see a black walnut tree in somebody's yard, you'll notice no other plants can grow underneath it because of that allelopathic chemical. And another one that foresters have to deal with all the time, uh, farmers as well, is um, the hay-scented fern. And hay scented fern can just take over an entire field. It can take over the whole forest floor underneath mature trees. Wherever hay scented fern is, that it emits a chemical that nothing else will grow through there. What happens as a result of that is you have this huge monoculture of this one plant. So this invasive species is now very dominant in the landscape. The other piece is that because invasive species are the first ones to leaf out in our region, and the last ones to lose their leaves, even in November sometimes they still have leaves on them, they have a longer and an earlier growing season than our native plants that are used to, okay, we can come out of the ground late April, early May, it's safe now, we're not gonna get any more snow, but we know that by October we should probably lose our leaves because we might get an early snow. These invasive species from other countries don't know that. What happens is they are now, their leaves are now um, absorbing all of the sunlight. They have all of the nutrients to themselves because the other plants are dormant and they can grow even more profusely. Third key point is that invasive species being not native do not have native predators or diseases that will help balance their populations in this region. And that's also key. Um, if a lot of our native plants have insects or diseases or animals that will browse on them to help keep the populations under control. These invasive species don't. You won't find deer munching on forsythia. I mean, not forsythia, but um, honeysuckle to help curb that population or eating the berries even. So those are the three key points that really make a non-native species invasive in our, um, in our environment. 
Now, native and species, uh, invasive species also impact our native ecosystems in several ways. And the first is um, by soils. They can go and through their chemical composition and their genetic makeup, they can uh, not only penetrate the soils with their root systems, they can heat the soils slightly, they can modify the soil chemistry. Um, there is actually a study that was done down in um, down south where it was found that um, the soil was um, adapted for this one invasive species. It actually increased the pH of the soil uh, made it sweeter so that some of our native plants that like a more acidic soil weren't happy. Um, it actually um, changed the nutrients so that there might be more calcium, there might be more nitrogen, which also again fed the invasive species but not the native species. Invasive species can impact fields and forests as well as riparian area, areas along streams and rivers and wetlands. They can take over those areas. And probably the, the key point for forests is when it takes over a forest, the baby trees can't grow. And so you end up with mature forest trees up above and down below just the shrubbery or vines of invasive species. So forest succession doesn't occur, the forest dies out, and you end up with a, a forest that kind of looks like this poor house under the kudzu. Um, it's just taken over by shrubs, and it becomes more of a shrubby, scrubby type habitat as opposed to a mature forest. In riparian areas and wetlands, the key factor is that when invasive species take over and prevent the trees from growing along the riverbanks and along the edges of the wetlands, is you lose two key ecosystem services um, that trees provide. And one is that you don't have trees filtering the uh, chemicals and, and um, components from the soil that can leach into the water to help filtrate the water. So the water quality goes down. And number two, you don't have trees along the edges to um, keep the water cool. So when you only have shrubs along the edge, the sunlight gets in and the water temperature goes up. That's not good for the fish. It's not good for the water quality. And in some places, you'll have more algae forming. Wildlife and habitat are also impacted by invasive species. Um, a lot of the shrubs that are invasive, honeysuckles one in particular, birds will still nest in it, um, but it's not it doesn't have the branching that is as sturdy and built the right way to house safe nests. It may not grow at the right height. So what happens is the birds are nesting lower to the ground on weaker branches and it allows the coyote walking along to come and you know help themselves to the baby birds. Um, the fruits that they produce don't have the fat and protein content that the migrating birds need in the spring and in the winter. They're high on carbs instead. And as far as fire intolerant ecosystems, a lot of our ecosystems in New England are fire intolerant, meaning that if a fire blows through, not only do the standing trees die, uh, and the vegetation above ground, but a lot of the seeds will die because they have not evolved with fire as a way to reproduce. Unlike the pine barrens up in the Ossipee area that need fire to open the cones and help them reproduce, uh, a lot of our other plants in this region are not tolerant of fire. So if you have a vining habitat like the wisteria, the uh, bittersweet vine, heaven forbid the kudzu ever gets up here, uh, but even the, the multiflora rows that start to wind their way up into the trees, you're creating a lot of fuel for potential fire, even a lightning strike. And the unfortunate thing is 
you know, we're used to if we get a lightning strike, the fire might burn and strike the tree and it burns the grass around it. We put it out because, you know, it's pretty moist habitat in New England. We don't worry about fire a whole lot. But if you have a lot of material accumulating and it climbs up into the tree in the crown of the tree up to the canopy, you can then have crown fires and crown fire can spread like the Western states find like, quote, wildfire. Um, so that really poses a big problem. And the other key that um, people are starting to really look at is what is the effect of invasive species on native plants and their resilience to climate change? The scientists will tell you that in order to um, be really resilient to climate change, you want to have a variety of plants um, of different heights, different shapes, different uh, growing seasons, different berry production seasons within um, an ecosystem, a forest, a neighborhood, a landscape, so that if a, a hurricane comes through and wipes out certain plants, others can survive. If a disease comes through and wipes out a couple of certain species, uh, the forest can still survive. But if you have invasive species taking over an ecosystem, and it's basically invasive species, no baby little trees that are growing up or other native plants, that ecosystem is no longer resilient to climate change. It's very, very stressed trying to survive the native, uh, the, the non-native invasion. And um, it just cannot fight off invasive species and climate change together. So, um, if we leave the invasive species as is, we have the potential for this kudzu house to be growing in a lot of different places. The invasive species will take over a lot of our um, forests, a lot of our fields, and, and that's what it's going to look like. Um, I do want to say that a lot of the plants that are on the invasive species list are native to Japan, China and Korea, they're all a zone five. We are a zone five. So um, climate wise, heat and cold wise, they've already um, adapt, they're already used to our, our climate in another country. What's different is with climate change, our climate in New Hampshire will become warmer and wetter, especially in the springtime with droughts in the summer, that's the projection. And what we're finding is vines in particular really love that environment. So anything with a vining habit will actually um, start to really thrive and potentially take over. Food for thought. So uh, New Hampshire does have, as I said earlier, uh, a list of prohibited invasive species that began in 2004. Um, they, the list includes insects as well as plants, and the plants are upland plants, which are those that do not uh, typically survive, thrive, or even grow in wetland situations. Um, those are trees, shrubs, and herbaceous material, such as the dame's rocket, which is a um, pinky purple flower that you see growing out in the woodlands in the early spring. Uh, it also includes water plants like the water flag, that yellow flag iris in the center. So there's a variety of plants that are on the invasive species list, but today we're focusing on the woody plants that people will just cut down on their property, throw it in their vehicle, bring to you as yard waste. The URL again is at the bottom if you want to um, refresh a complete list of that. Um, the, we're going to focus on eight species in particular that I feel and have heard and have talked to people and know are most likely to be brought to your solid waste facility or established at your solid waste facility, whether or not um, the seeds showed up unknowingly or the birds dropped them or the deer brought them by, however, the wind perhaps. I'm going to start off with autumn olive, and it's a thorny shrub that can grow to about 20 feet tall. It likes a lot of sun, but it is also drought tolerant, so there's that adaptability piece. What's fun about autumn olive is that the stems are really soft, so they're fun to cut with clippers. They won't hurt you. 
um, they have little lenticels, which are little um, white spots along the stems. And the one of the key identifying factors of autumn olive is that the underside of the leaves have this very pretty silvery color to them, as opposed to the Russian olive, which is plain old green. The berries are also speckled in silver. So if somebody cuts down a shrub and you happen to notice that the undersides of the leaves are silver, the berries are all speckled, most likely you're looking at autumn olive. Uh, it was brought in in the 50s to use for wildlife habitat and um, the berries actually do make a good jam. Some of the issues with autumn olive, which also known as Japanese silverberry and spreading oleaster is that yes, it does spread. It has thorns and you'll see a couple of thorns. Um, this is actually a thorn here and another one up here. And the problem with some of these thorns is that they can be two to three, sometimes almost four inches in uh, length and they will totally destroy your tractor tire. I've gone through quite a few tractor tires over the years, not knowing that I was driving over a thorn from an autumn olive. Heavy, heavy berry production. Um, it's very possible to have several thousand um, berries on one plant that's not even a large plant. It is a nitrogen fixer, so it creates its own fertilizer in a way. It outcompetes native plants as a result that do not um, use atmospheric nitrogen. And as a result of that extra nitrogen, it also thrives on poor soil. So you'll see it on roadsides, um, disturbed areas, sometimes log landings, old fields, any place that a lot of other plants don't want to grow, autumn olive is very, very happy. There are two types of barberry that are on the invasive species list in New Hampshire, the Japanese and the European. And the Japanese has brown twigs while the European has gray twigs. The Japanese has smooth leaves. There's no serration or teeth on the leaves, but the European has toothed leaves. The difference, the biggest difference that you'll notice right away is that the Japanese barberry is usually two to three feet tall. It kind of has a spreading habit. It's more horizontal, whereas the European barberry can grow 10 to 12 feet tall. So you've got a really tall shrub. Japanese barberry has single barbs or thorns along the stem, whereas the European has thorns that are in little triplets on the stems. The berries of the Japanese barberry, uh, it's one berry per short stem, where the European barberry has berries hanging in droops like grapes. So it's very easy to distinguish the difference between uh, both barberries. Now, why is barberry a problem? It's really pretty in the fall with its pretty little red leaves. There are a lot of issues with barberry. Um, it tolerates a variety of soil types. It can grow in full sun. It can grow in full shade. It can grow in a forest under heavy, um, heavy canopy where it's really dark. It re-sprouts through root fragments. So if you dig up a shrub or you pull up a shrub, you don't get all of the roots. There's little pieces left. It can actually form a new plant from those root fragments. It alters the soil pH, it alters the nitrogen by producing nitrogen, and it also increases the temperature, in particular, the Japanese barberry because of that compact habit. It's the one on the left here. Japanese barberry, um, studies were done in Connecticut, and they found that this type of a habit with a zillion little leaves on it created a warmer microclimate, and ticks actually love that warmer microclimate. In growing two to three feet above the ground, it's right at the height where if you walk by, it can latch right, a tick will latch right onto you. Um, so if you're out hunting this fall or going for a walk in the woods and meandering through the woods and you see some Japanese barberry, do not go near it. You could bring a few little friends home that you don't want. The center picture is a field in Alstead uh, with all Japanese barberry bushes that took over. And they went through a program, the EQIP program through uh, NRCS and USDA to help get some funding to remove the plants, um, which is an option. And then on the right, you have the European barberry taking over the tree. 
Um, so the Japanese barberry, um, beside is you know the biggest problem with it is the tick habitat. While the European barberry, it hosts a pathogen that will cause wheat rust, and as a result, you don't see many European barberry shrubs out in the Midwest anymore. They used to be commonplace at every homestead because they were uh, the better plant to be using for making jam and jelly. Oriental bittersweet, it's one of the plants that foresters love to hate, also known as the Asiatic bittersweet vine, a very vining habit, prolific berries along the branches. Um, now, what's key is the Oriental bittersweet has these yellowy colored husks on the fruit. That's a key point to remember. The stems of the older vines can grow actually up to four inches in diameter. I've actually seen them a little bit larger on older plants out in the middle of the forest where they're incredibly girdling mature forest trees. Um, the leaves are slightly toothed and a little bit wavy in their form. They tolerate sun and shade, dry and moist soils, highly adaptable, a key characteristic of invasive species. I do want to point out that there is a native bittersweet, the American bittersweet, which is also a vine. Um, however, the difference is the berries do not grow along the stem like the invasive species. They only grow at the tips, which is called a terminal cluster. So only at the very end of the vine will you find their berries. And they have darker orange husks. Little seeds uh, covers are darker orange. I don't have photos of those because the American bittersweet vine is now becoming so rare, it's really hard to find it in the wild. Some of the issues with the bittersweet, we could spend the whole day talking about these. Um, it is shade tolerant. It dominates forests and the woods edges. It grows on roads, rivers, disturbed areas, telephone poles, trees, any place that it can climb. It shades out the native trees and shrubs and it girdles the trees by climbing around it, um, choking the tree and actually growing into the bark over time. It also can uproot native trees and shrubs because the vine with all of its uh, canes on it um, and all of its berries can be so heavy, it can actually topple a tree over if it's all growing on one side. So um, very dominant when it gets into a landscape. What's really key about bittersweet is that it can re-sprout not only from the crown, when you cut the vine off, it can re-sprout from that same spot, or if you go to dig up the vine uh, or pull it out of the ground, if you've left any little pieces of the orange root in the ground, that can form a whole new plant. Um, and what's concerning is that it can hybridize with the native species, which is partially why it's harder to find the native species anymore. I've actually experimented with pulling up the bittersweet and you have to do it every single year because eventually these new little shoots will come up and you got to keep pulling and pulling and pulling. One of the biggest problems with bittersweet, the oriental bittersweet, is that it does change the soil chemistry. Um, it increases the potassium and the calcium. It increases the temperature. Um, it increases leaf litter decomposition. And that's a problem for the forest trees that it is uh, living with because it's eating up all the food that the trees would want to be using. Uh, and as a result, it affects forest succession because it's crowding out baby trees or smothering them out so they can't grow. And as I explained earlier, you end up with a forest that has mature trees and then nothing but vine. And it won't be until a disturbance happens that the trees get cut down, a hurricane wipes them out, that new trees can grow. However, the bittersweet vine has probably already taken over the space. And the only thing else that can grow in that changed soil without leaf litter is probably another invasive species. So it creates this cycle of just going downhill for an ecosystem to be healthy. Buckthorn, we have two types on the invasive species list. We have a glossy and a common buckthorn. Both are multi-stem shrubs or trees that can grow as tall as 20 to 30 feet tall. The bark is gray to brown, and they don't have a little uh, cover over their buds. They have what's called a naked um, bud. 
that's a rusty brown color. color. They have vertical lenticels, those little white spots are actually vertical on the new twigs, uh, alternate branching. And the greenish yellow flowers, you don't normally notice them when they flower because they blend in with the foliage. What's key about the buckthorn is from early summer onward, they are producing berries and seed. Um, so you'll see a shrub that will have red berries and maturing to the blue-black color at the same time. There's three to four seeds in every little fruit, which is about the size of a blueberry. And what's really key is that the seeds can be fertile in the soil for five years and still grow into a plant. So if the seeds are dropped onto the ground, they get covered with leaf litter, or something happens and the soil's too dry, we have a drought or we have a flood um, or cool summer, conditions aren't right for those seeds to grow for a couple of seasons, they can stay down into that soil under the leaf litter as many as five years and still when the conditions are right, become a whole new plant, fooling us into thinking that we got rid of the buckthorn when we really did not. So glossy buckthorn um, is identified as differently from the common buckthorn by the leaves in particular. Glossy buckthorn has really glossy, shiny leaves and eight to nine veins along the leaves. If you count these, I think there's nine of them. Whereas the common buckthorn, which a lot of times you'll see in, in wetland areas, um, not necessarily just there, has dull leaves on the underside and they have fine toothing, whereas the glossy does not. The common has fine teeth and only three to five veins. So that's how you can tell the two apart. However, for your purposes, whether it's glossy or common, it's going to do the same thing in an environment, in an ecosystem. There is a native alder leafed buckthorn that lives in wetlands and it has smaller leaves um, and the serrations on the leaves are really rounded. Um, and chances are you probably won't encounter that when it only grows uh, up to maybe about three feet tall. Um, it can get confused and even these buckthorns can get fused with the native dogwood, but the native dogwood has um, opposite branching as opposed to the buckthorn, which is alternate branching. So those are some key um, identification factors for those. So what are some of the issues with buckthorn and why should we worry about it? Well, it does grow in sun and shade, wet and dry, varying soil pH, it's highly adaptable. Um, if you top kill the plant early in the season, you cut it down and you leave it, it can still produce fruit on new growth during that same growing season. That is how prolific it is. Cut it down in the spring and you still have fruit later in the season. It likes to invade moist woodlands, disturbed areas, roadsides. It forms really dense thickets. It displaces seedlings, shrubs, and native understory plants. Um, the college woods over at UNH in Durham has had a really bad problem with the buckthorn over the years that they have a big pine stand, mature pine, and the young pine couldn't grow because the buckthorn was taking it over. They literally had a young forest of buckthorn. So they've spent numerous years working to get rid of the buckthorn. The common buckthorn is also poisonous. Um, it is an alternate host to a couple of diseases, the alfalfa mosaic virus and the oak crown rust, and also um, can be habitat for the soybean aphid. So in the Midwest, it's uh, a severe problem. Burning bush is a multi-stemmed shrub that can grow to 10 feet tall. It's one that everybody notices during foliage season. It also has opposite leaves like some of our natives. What um, sets it aside is that it has what we call little corky wings. They're, wood, they're woody um, growths on the stem, which makes the stem almost appear square. The native winged elm and sweet gum only have two of those on the stem, but the burning bush actually has four. There are four seeds for each one of those little fruits, which again are about the size of a small blueberry. And the bright red fall foliage, which is why we love the plant and we grow it um, you know, uh, everywhere uh, for landscaping, um, can be not 
confused with blueberries and dogwoods because the burning bush is really, really distinctive bright red color, whereas blueberries and dogwoods, which are our native reds in the fall, are much more of a maroon color. So if somebody's bringing in a plant and you look at it and say, wow, that is really bright red, it's most likely a burning bush if you don't, or if you just see the leaves and you don't see the square stem. If you um, just see the leaves and they're maroon, they're more likely um, the native plant. You can also tell by the shape, but um, the color right away will give you a good hint. So one of the issues with the burning bush is that it adapts to everything. It doesn't matter what the climate, the soil, the pH, how much light it gets. The only difference is the more light it gets, the brighter the red color. It forms really dense thickets and it replaces native plants. So in the foreground, you have a photo of uh, the burning bush taking over the edge of a field and it's going into the woods. Uh, they're behind the, uh, the plants that you can see. It's taking over the woodland. So it's crowding out uh, the blueberry bushes that are trying to grow in the background, any of the dogwood, the young pine trees, they're all getting crowded out. It's all gonna be a burning bush forest underneath there. It can reproduce through seeds, which the birds love, um, and it also can spread through sprouts. Um, if you break it off, it can re-sprout. The seeds germinate really easily, and it is possible on one plant to find literally a hundred babies underneath that one plant, and it might next year it might have a hundred more babies underneath that one plant. So. Um, Prolific, prolific cedar. The honeysuckle, there's actually four species of honeysuckle that are on New Hampshire's invasive species list. Um, three of them, the first three, the Amer, the Moros, and the Etrecarian, are shrubs or bushes that can grow up to 20 feet tall. The Japonica, the Japanese honeysuckle, is a vine which can grow to 80 feet tall or long, depending on where it's growing, and has two to three seeds in its little tiny fruit. The honeysuckles uh, can be picked out from other shrubs by having opposite branching, like a dogwood, but unlike the native honeysuckles and unlike the native shrubs, it has a hollow pith. So if you see a stem, and you cut it and it's all black inside and you look really closely, you're gonna find that it's hollow. That is a dead giveaway that the honeysuckle is not native to this country. The invasive honeysuckles hold their flowers and their berries above the leaves. Whereas the, um, the native will not. The, there's um, the native honeysuckles like the mountain fly honeysuckle. The berries hang down below the leaves and those shrubs rarely get above three feet tall. They're very um, inconspicuous in the forest or a, a, a field at a woody edge. It, it likes a sheltered, more of a sheltered location, but they're a very um, quiet plant, if I could use that as a description. They don't you know, try to take a lot of attention. They're just there as a pretty little plant with pretty little pairs of berries hanging down. Some of the issues with the honeysuckle is that they will grow in sun and shade. They're adaptable to dry and moist sites. They're adaptable to varying soil and pH. Again, a very highly adaptable plant. They establish readily on disturbed sites. They form dense thickets, shading out the native plants. Um, they have early leaf out. So they're actually one of the very first invasive species to start leafing out. They have uh, early fruiting. They propagate by both seeds and by layering. And again, that layering is wherever the branches, the lower branches on the shrub, if they lean down and touch the ground, they will form a new plant. And that's how the thicket can continue to keep moving across the property. Berries are considered poisonous to humans. 
Japanese knotweed is the invasive that everybody really wants to hate, known as Mexican bamboo or fleece flower. It's a very dense and fast growing shrub. It can grow up to 10 feet tall. It can grow as much as eight inches per day. It can spread 20 to 60 feet wide per plant. Its roots, and this is key for management, um, its roots can grow as deep as six to 10 feet into the soil. And Japanese knotweed also has rhizomes, which are horizontal stems that grow under the soil surface. And as they grow horizontally, every so often they send up a new shoot up into the sky to form another plant. Those rhizomes form two thirds of the plant's mass. So if you see a shrub that is 20 to 60 feet wide, you know that there's even more than that in the rhizomes underneath the ground. It's just a mass of roots and rhizomes underneath. The stems of the Japanese knotweed are semi-woody with a hollow center, very much like bamboo. And the shoots can be uh, eaten very early in the spring before they start to take on that really woody texture. Um, one of the downsides, it's also a plus, is that they flower really late in the season. You'll see it growing along the roadsides, all this beautiful white flower um, in September. The bees love it. It's one of the last flowering plants for the bees late in the season. However, as the bees are, are going to these flowers, they're also pollinating and helping to make a lot of seed. A lot of issues with Japanese knotweed. It is allelopathic, so it sends out a chemical through those rhizomes to suppress other plants from growing in the area. It does grow along the roadsides. Snow plows can bump it and um, help it propagate again through broken pieces. It grows along the riverbanks, so the trees won't grow along the riverbanks. It grows in disturbed areas. It tolerates everything, hot, sun, drought, salty areas, shade, flooding, you name it. It's very, very, very adaptable. As a result of the allelopathy and being so adaptable, it forms these huge monocultures, or just masses of knotweed. It does prevent tree establishment. Um, and as I said, segments of those little rhizomes, if, if you break it off, they only has to be a half an inch long can produce a new plant and it might sit there for 20 years in the soil before it sends up a new stem and a new plant. So it, you know, you really might think, finally, it's taken me 10 years, I got rid of this Japanese knotweed and then pop, one year a new plant comes up and you have to start over again with the management. Very, very difficult plant to deal with. Even worse is those seeds, the thousands and thousands of seeds on each plant the germination rate in a study in New Hampshire found that 95% of them were viable. So um, it really likes New Hampshire. Multiflora rose is another plant that really likes New Hampshire. Um, it's a climbing shrub. It usually grows to about 15 feet tall when it's really happy. It can grow as wide as 10 feet wide for one shrub. It can form a thicket up to 30 feet in diameter with just canes going in every direction. Um, and as the canes are climbing on top of each other, it can actually reach as high as 30 feet in some spaces. Um, the canes may be 13 feet long, they may be even longer. I've actually cut some down that seemed like they were about 20 feet long in spots before. The canes typically have thorns on them, but they don't always have thorns, so don't you know, say, well, it doesn't have thorns, it can't be a multiflora rose, it still can be. What is really unique to multiflora rose is that where you look at the, where the leaf stem attaches to the main cane of the plant, you'll see what's called a feathery stipule. It's this little green growth that looks kind of like a feather, and it's very unique to multiflora rose. So if somebody brings you a rose bush, oh, I just cut down my rose bush at home, can I put it in the compost pile? or in the leaf and yard waste. If you see these little feathery stipules, your answer is no. It's, it's a multiflora rose, we can't accept it. Multiflora rose was used as root stock for hybridizing roses because of its prolific growth, um, but it also because of its flowers. They're very pretty, they smell incredible, and they bloom May and June. 
and they're, they're just really nice to have in the landscape for that reason, but that's the only reason. Um, they prefer moist, well-drained soil, but they will grow in full sun. They'll grow in ditches. They love to grow in ditches because of that moisture, but they'll grow along fences. They'll take over stone walls. They'll, they're, again, highly, highly adaptable. So some of the issues with the multiflora rose is not only can they grow by all of those seeds, those little rose hips, but wherever the canes touch the ground, they can form root and to the ground and form a whole new plant. And that helps to create this um, hedge. Also, when you cut them down, they can sprout again once you cut them and form new plants. This is really key and scary. Uh, a mature, one mature multiflora rose can produce a half a million seeds per year. That's how prolific these plants can be. And the seeds that drop to the ground that you don't notice can actually stay in the soil as much as 20 years and still be viable growing new plants. Um, the rose hips can persist in the winter time. So if you find uh, a shrub with little red berries on it in the fall, it may be um, it may be one of the plants you notice that normally grows in the swamp, one of the native winterberry holly, or it could be a multiflora rose. And so the um, animals that walk by it might drop some of the seeds in the winter time. The plow truck might pick them up and push them down the road, and all of a sudden you've got new populations growing where they weren't before. Again, it's another plant that leaves out very early on, which makes gives it a competitive edge over the native plants. And because it's shade tolerant, it can grow in places that you don't want it to grow under trees um, in particular. So um, those are the eight species that you are most likely to find either growing at a solid waste facility or being brought to a solid waste facility. And what I want to do is review some of the key points um, of these plants as far as identification. The plants that can re-sprout from the root fragments or for laying, uh, from layering. Now the root fragments, you just break off a little piece of the root or the rhizome, or the layering is when they touch the ground and form new roots. Are the barberry, bittersweet, burning bush, honeysuckle, Japanese knotweed, multiflora rose. So basically just about all of them, okay? Plants with very deep roots, Japanese knotweed, which is why it's so difficult to get rid of it. Plants that have seeds that are viable for at least five years or more, are the buckthorn and the multiflora rose. So it's really, really important to make sure that you capture as many of the seeds as you can before they hit the ground. Plants that can create tick habitat are barberry and bittersweet. Plants that are considered poisonous to humans are buckthorn and honeysuckle. So Janine. Yes. This is, this is Tara. Can we go back to that slide real quick? So those of you that are in attendance, this slide might be a really good one to take a screenshot of. If you do not have the capability or the ability or the or you don't know how to do that, um, let me know and I can get this list out to you. This this one, the information was amazing. Um, and this list stuck with me when when Janine first pulled it up. So I want you guys to to make sure that you get this along with all of the other handouts and information that Janine gave. And um, again, you'll have the PDF of this presentation that you can access later, uh, access later. but um, by looking at this particular list, um, it's important to, I put it in, in this format because I felt it was really important to understand why these plants are so bad for the environment, why they are so invasive, why they have such a competitive edge, and it's these adaptability issues. These are the way these particular plants have found ways to outcompete all of the native plants in this country and really uh, take over an environment. And these are also the ways that we need to be thinking about when we talk about the management piece of it. How are we gonna now manage if Japanese knotweed can have root systems that go 10 feet into the ground? Well, obviously we can't dig up the plants, so how are we gonna manage for that? 
if multiflora rose seeds are good for 20 years, how are we going to keep, you know, depleting the, the seed bank to make sure that we don't have any more roses in this area? So those are some of the problems uh, that we're dealing with um, because of these plants being brought to this country for both ornamental and for conservation reasons for wildlife. Um, they really love this particular habitat, but this is what we're dealing with is, you know, their high adaptability and uh, productivity ability, uh, ability to reproduce themselves in a variety of ways. So um, if you haven't taken a screenshot, do it now if you're going to. Um, what I would like to do is pause for a quick second and see if you have any questions for me about identification of these plants or if you feel it's time for a quick 15 minute break and then we will move on to the what can we do about all of this i actually have a question while people are typing or raising hands to be unmuted um i have a question uh mm -hmm. my i'm thinking of my mother-in-law who makes reeds and the berries, all of the people that, that go and cut the berries and clip the berries, and it's like, oh, these are so pretty to put in the wreaths. Um, mm -hmm. Are we seeing, the, the one that stuck with me that you had mentioned was the, um, the multiflora rose, because those berries look like the ones that people use in wreaths a lot of times. And it's very, like you said, very similar to the winter berry. Do we see people, is that, is that one thing that people are doing that they should not be doing, is using the wrong berries? Yes. Absolutely, yes. Um, the other berry that people use a lot is the oriental bittersweet because the the covers, a little orange, the little yellowy covers peel back and then you're left with this berry that's very, very hard so it dries really well. And a lot of people will actually take the bittersweet vine and create the wreath out of the vine itself. It's very easy to do if you know how to make a wreath. Um, just keep winding it round and round and round. And then you hang it on your door and you put a couple leaves in it or some colored corn or whatever. And there you go. You got a beautiful, very colorful fall decoration for your door. Mm -hmm. What happens though is, you know, if it's outside, the birds come and they see those orange berries and they take the berries with them and drop them someplace else that you don't want another plant. Um, or the end of the, oh it's time now for the christmas wreath so we're going to get rid of this one i'm just going to toss it in the trash um you know we'll just take it to the recycling center and uh, then all of a sudden you've transported a whole bunch of berries to another place that you don't want them or well we don't need that wreath anymore just throw it in the compost pile it'll you know it'll decompose well it'll decompose but the berries will grow so um part of your job working at a solid waste facility if you see these coming in if you see people using berries in their decorations that they're throwing away is to help educate them that wherever you're putting berries you're putting um, you're putting new plants and it might be a plant that you like but it's probably a plant that we don't want um, the multiflora rose and the um, oriental bittersweet in particular have heavy, heavy uh, clumps of fruits, which is why we use them for crafts, because you get this nice cluster of, of berries together that look really pretty, big bunches of them. So, um, you know, the education goes a long way, but also disposal, and we're gonna talk about disposal after we take a break, specifically what people can be doing if they are collecting those berries for uh, a decoration and they want to get rid of them later at the recycling center, how, how they can deal with that. Yep. So. so I think another thing, um, Janine, that I thought of while I was listening, and I'm, uh, there's a couple of people who are asking about um, photos of all the eight plants together, and I know you have a slide with them mm -hmm. all, and we'll put that up on the screen. Um, there is a through the NRRA, I don't know if you've ever heard of them, it's the Northeast Resource Recovery Association. They have a side group um, called New Hampshire the Beautiful, and they can provide signage to their members 
um, and most of the municipal transfer stations in the state of New Hampshire are members. And so they can get signage, all sorts of different types of signs. And I'm wondering if we can work with them to develop a sign with the, the photos of the invasive species or something like that. I'm just spitballing here, but it might be something that's very helpful uh, to these, the, these facilities. And it's a different type of sign. They, they, many of the facilities have been around for so long, they've gotten all the signs that they can get. And they mm -hmm. get so many points, members get so many points where you can get some free signs. And so if we can have some put together or created, that might be a good thing. And I know that the NRRA just got a USDA grant to assist specifically with signage for solid waste facilities. Ha ha. <laughs> that sounds that sounds great, and and I would throw that um, right out to everybody who's uh, attending this workshop today. Is would it be helpful for you at your facility to have a sign that either identifies a few of the invasive species you're most concerned about in your particular town, uh, or has rules about how to dispose of invasive species if they bring it to your facility? So mm -hmm. I would throw that out to you to be thinking about as we go through the second half of this workshop um, and feel free to share your comments and questions yes. with that too. Yep. All right. So I am not seeing the only um the only question that has come through that is is one that I am. Oh, wait a minute. We've got we've got a couple questions that are coming in. They are going to be answered after the break. So I won't bring those up. Um, <laughs> So it's, it looks like you covered everything that they needed. Um, so what we are gonna do, we are gonna take a 15 minute break. I'm gonna ask Janine to put that slide up with the pictures, with the eight pictures. And we'll just, we're just gonna leave that up there for, throughout the break. So it's 10, 10 now. So I gotta do math in my head. If everybody could come back by 10, 25, that would be great. Um, and Janine and I are going to mute and turn our cameras off and go get some coffee and get something to drink. Uh, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. All right, thank you. You may have thought of while we were gone, let me know. Um, I also have turned the recording back on. I remembered to turn it off for the break. Um, <clears throat> so before we get going, we do have a couple of poll questions. Give me a second. Okay. So the invasive upland plant that has the deepest roots is what? See how you guys did. We're getting two answers, Janine. See, see who did best in a second. There's a couple more seconds. <clears throat> we'll see how well everybody was paying attention. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, the voting's pretty good. Oh. All right, so I'm going to close and share. So we got 84% said Japanese knotweed, 8% said Japanese honeysuckle, and 8% said autumn olive. So what do we got, Janine? The correct answer is Japanese knotweed. Ding, 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 Yay! ding, ding. And you said that goes up to 10 feet deep? up to 10 feet deep in the soil. Um, the Japanese honeysuckle and the autumn olive have root systems that grow more horizontally across the ground. Um, they do send roots down in a couple of feet, but they don't, do not go down 10 feet. All right, okay. So the next one, so this is choose all that apply. So at my facility, I have the following invasive species growing. Be honest in your answers. Hmm. 
It's okay to have no idea. Yes. <laughs> and that's why we're doing the class. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to close and share. So it looks like I did pick the, the right three. So the Japanese knotweed 50%, burning bush and bittersweet. Um, we had 35% of you that said, I have no idea. That's okay. You're going to <laughs> learn from this class and you're going to go take it from there. And then some of you said more than the three listed. For those of you that said more than the three listed, can you type in the question box what others you have? Um, Spelling does not count. It might take a couple seconds. <clears throat> or even if you want to wait and type it later, that's fine too. We can let people know. All right, well, y'all are working on those. Throw out. Japanese knotweed did not surprise me. That's what I expected people to say. This is the last one. And this is kind of a trick question because we haven't covered it yet. What is the best method of eradicating an upland plant? It's supposed to say upland plant invasive species. So Janine, can you see the answers as they're coming in or no? No, or it's just me. Small. Okay, so it's just me, okay. So we, the answer, the cho choices are burning, mowing, girdling, cutting, suffocation, chemical application, and it depends. Mm -hmm. Let me give you guys a couple more seconds. All right. This feedback so, is great. Yeah, good. So we got 4% said burning. 0% said mowing, girdling, or cutting, 23% said suffocation, 23% said chemical application, and a resounding 50% of you said, it depends. So <laughs> Janine is going to talk about that now. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we move into this next section of the presentation, which is talking about methods of uh, managing these species? If you have a question, just raise your hand quickly and then type it in. Or And did you have any uh, people typing in the other species growing at their facilities? Not yet. Um, okay. And that when they do come in, I will let you know what we what we're seeing. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got something popping. Oh. Um, we had a question. How likely is the signage to be available? Let, we'll, that we got ahead of ourselves on that one. We will talk about that. That is probably something that will be very likely, um, but I cannot give you a exact answer right now. Okay, all right. I am going to hop off and turn my um, mic and camera off. And Janine, I'm gonna leave it to you. Okay, um, as far as plants that are growing around solid waste facilities and even capped landfills and sites from former old dumps. Um, in my experience in New Hampshire, and this is just from places that I've been, I've seen a lot of honeysuckle, I've seen a lot of bittersweet, and I've seen a lot of multi-flora rose. Um, if it's any place that's near old cellar holes and homesteads, that's where you tend to find the honeysuckle and the barberry. Um, the, and probably some of the bittersweet. A lot of the other plants are um, ones that escaped, traveled down the edges of the road, came in from the birds, um, but the honeysuckle in one is one in particular that if you find it in the woods, you're probably going to find an old homestead because it was a plant that everybody wanted back in the 1800s. So um, I'm curious you know, whether other people are working with at their facilities. So in this section, we're going to switch over from trying to identify and recognize some of these knotty plants and look at some of the common management methods that are out there. And um, 
the goal of all of these methods is to remove the plants that are mature enough to fruit and to exhaust the seed bank. And if that's the one goal that you have at your facility and that's all you can accomplish, then you are accomplishing a major, major goal and pat yourself on the back for that. Because if you keep cutting plants back before they form flowers and are allowed to um, go to seed, and um, what will happen is the plants will keep um, growing and they will keep trying to send out new plants from whatever seeds are still left in the soil. And that one practice alone will be enough to eventually exhaust the seed bank and reduce the new population. You'll just be left with the older plants. However, it means it's still an ongoing process that you have to keep on working at it. If your facility doesn't have the funding to bring somebody in to deal with this, or you just have a few plants, uh, focus on exhausting that seed bank, bank and getting rid of the fruiting, uh, the fruit potential. Um, that is the good goal for you. That's a manageable goal. So some of the control techniques that have been used with invasive species include the hand pulling and the digging, um, some of the biological methods, uh, including girdling, which can go under biological or mowing and cutting, smothering, burning, and using the use of chemicals. So I'm gonna highlight um, bits and pieces of each of those for you today. I'm gonna touch on disposal, but then I'm gonna turn it over to Tara so that she can talk specifically about regulations that you need to follow at your facilities. A couple of notes, and again, these are important to remember too, is that not all invasive species respond equally to the same treatment. So a treatment that might work well for one may not work for another. Also, um, treatments don't always work as well uh, during different seasons. Um, or even in the same season with different weather um, scenarios. So if you are working uh, and it's a moist, wet summer, uh, seeds might be more likely to sprout and you may have more seedlings that you can be pulling because the soil is very loose and easy to pull plants from. But you might be wanting to um, be pulling plants and we have a drought. And if it's like this year, the soil is like concrete and nothing wants to come out of it. So um, it really depends on the time of year, the time of treatment, the type of plant, and just how you know everything falls into place. It's, it's, it's very um, site specific. Multiple treatments and mixed methods may be needed to control or eradicate an invasive species population. And I think that most people that work with invasive species that try to eradicate them will agree that they have found this to be the case over the years in just about any place that they've worked. So you may start with one treatment and it might help reduce the population a little bit, but it's not getting rid of it. So you try something else or you try a couple things at the same time. And again, because everything is site specific, you need to figure out what works best for you at that particular moment, also with your human power and your, your budget. Uh, in order to reduce the spread of these invasive species, there's a couple things that I suggest you focus on. First is to remove any of the small populations that you might find. There might be one Japanese knotweed that's just starting on the edge of the, the road going into the facility. There might be just three honeysuckle over there on the corner, you know, by the woods. And also focus on um, the mature populations that are bearing fruit and seed by preventing them from bearing fruit and seed. So those are the, the two best ways to really start to reduce the population in a manageable way without feeling like the plants are still here. What am I doing wrong? No, as long as you're controlling the regeneration, you're doing something right. So hand pulling and digging uh, are probably the most time consuming, but they are economically um, in a lot of ways the easiest to, to do. Um, it's very easy to find volunteers sometimes. Um, 
conservation groups, conservation commission might be able to help out, school groups, they have a polling party and you show everybody what this plant looks like. And this happens a lot with buckthorn and garlic mustard and, and uh, other plants is they have a big polling party and teach people about it. And everybody goes in and pulls up whatever they can and throwing it into the trash bags and try to clear out an area that, you know, as quickly as possible. It works well for buckthorn seedlings and saplings, you know, up to maybe three, four feet tall, um, especially if they're in smaller populations and again in sandy soil, so it's easy to pull. My favorite time for pulling plants out of the ground is in the springtime when the frost is just working its way out of this out of the ground because th there's so much moisture. That's when the, the rocks seem to want to come out of the ground easily too. Um, but you can actually pull a plant and get the entire long tap root without breaking it off. So if you happen to be someplace where you find invasives, especially the younger, smaller ones, and the soil is really, really wet from the frost working its way out, if you just pull gently, you can get that whole plant. If not, after a rainy, um, after it's been raining and the soil's really wet, or if it's in sandy soils. Burning bush seedlings can be pulled out uh, relatively easily, and some of the smaller shrubs can be dug out as an easy way to control their populations. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see this burning bush shrub. It's about, uh, I'm gonna say it was almost four feet tall uh, when I decided I needed to get rid of it. So I dug it up, and here's the root ball from that one shrub. The root ball itself weighed a good 50 pounds, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. And if you look at all of these feeder roots, um, they extended out more than the height of this one burning bush. So just be aware that when you go to dig invasive species, don't just dig around the collar where all of the uh, stems meet each other at the base of the plant. You've got to really dig out far and wide and really gently to try to get out all of these main roots that secure it to the ground but also for some of these shrubs, these main roots can also form new plants, just as a reminder. You can also hand pull or dig honeysuckle, autumn olive, multiflora rose, which is not fun if it's full of thorns, but it can be done. And then also barberry shrubs up to about three feet tall. So remember the Japanese barberry is normally up to about three feet tall and the European is the one that grows 10 to 12 feet tall. So in a manageable size, you can dig up the barberry and you can dig up the oriental bittersweet. But as um, a reminder, both of those can re-sprout from root segments. So if you're not getting the entire root, it will send up more plants. And the pictures up here, um, I hand pulled a barberry shoot that had grown in the ground to see what would happen in couple, just a couple weeks later. Um, it sent out a new shoot, and if you were to follow these roots around, it had broken off the main root that was under the ground. This was a whole new stem and a new root system. This root system is longer than this plant is tall from this little piece that was left in the ground. What's also important to um, notice is the bright orange stems or root systems rather, that the bittersweet has. So if you are digging around in the ground and you see bright orange, where you had oriental bittersweet, that's another piece of the root system that can become another plant. Biological control. Now, I have said that earlier when we were talking about identification. Um, there are no known predators that are native, diseases, insects, etc., cetera, for uh, basically all of these invasive species, which is one of the reasons that they can just invade our this part of our planet so easily. People are trying other ways besides the digging and the chemicals to get rid of plants. And one of them is by using goats and sheep to um, feed on these plants and help dwindle them down. One of the reasons is if you get rid of all of the leaf material, the plant can't photosynthesize. So it's not making a lot of energy that can go down to the roots and help it produce new shoots and new plants. Um, goats and sheep have been known to be effective with buckthorn and multiflora rose. Uh, the jury's still out on the knotweed, again, because the root systems are so deep, but it is being experimented with, with uh, the goats and the sheep and the knotweed. 
Um, good news is that Japanese knotweed has a psyllid, which is a little tiny insect. It's a sap sucker. And it feeds on knotweed sap in particular. And aphis has done a lot of testing with this insect because again, it's not from here. It's you know bringing in a biological control method from the country where the plant originated, um, just like with um, the um, emerald ash borer in a way. Uh, but they have been testing this down in West Virginia. And so far, it appears that the little psyllid is able to suck enough sap out of the knotweed to weaken it and potentially kill it. But this is going to be ongoing testing, but at least there's something positive uh, that we're working on uh, with the Japanese knotweed. Uh, Multiflora rose has been studied over the years. How can we control this population? There is a viral pathogen that is native to the Western states that has been studied. It, what it does is it causes a rose rosette disease. So if the um, rose itself gets diseased, it cannot form rose hips and seeds to reproduce. And um, the jury's still out on that, but they are studying that continually, as well as the European rose chalcid, which is a non-native wasp, that eats the seeds of this rose. So again, we are looking at non-natives to control a non-native population. Um, these are natural predators um, and diseases of these plants in their uh, countries of origin. We don't know, they may not know for another century, what the effects of those non-native control biological me uh, measures are on other plants in this area but um, testing is undergoing. The only thing that, um, you know, other thing that we have is just trying to eat the plants and see if we can eat enough of them. That's about it for the biological control. It's very, very difficult to find ways to biologically, naturally get rid of these plants. Smothering is another alternative that some people are using specifically with Japanese knotweed. Um, you can use 7 mil black plastic. You can also use the roofing, the, the heavy, heavy, it's almost rubber roofing um, that comes off of some of the old buildings when they're putting a new roof on um, and because it's weighted down. And the whole idea is you cut the Japanese knotweed down and then you cover the stems with wood chips because you don't want the stems to start to poke up through your plastic because once it reaches air and sunlight, it's gonna keep on growing. So you really have to find a way to, to really smother it. So you put down the wood chips and then you put down this heavy black plastic and then you put more wood chips on top of the plastic and then you weight it down um, and then you wait. It's recommended that the size of the covering extend out at least five feet from the area that the uh, Japanese knotweed was in. Because of those rhizomes, you wanna make sure that those rhizomes in the soil can't sense that there's a warmer climate just a few feet away and so that they might try to use up some of their reserves and grow towards that warmer climate and pop up from underneath the plastic beyond where the plastic is. Um, Doug Sigan is a, a wealth of information with the New Hampshire Invasive Species Program, and if you have questions on using the black plastic of Japanese knotweed or any of the other invasives, he's a great contact. The thing about the weighting is it's recommended that you leave this plastic down for at least five years. So, you know, you're, you're investing a lot of time into seeing if this method actually works. So burning may or may not be an option, uh, depending on regulations, time of year, uh, and what the environment is where the invasive species is. Buckthorn, when it's burned, uh, it does kill the top of the plant. It does not kill the root system, but you have to repeat this every two to three years. And the whole reason that you would even use it to begin with is if you top kill the plant, it's not forming new seeds, 
any buckthorn that emerges during those non-fire years or those non-burn years are the seeds that are in the seed bank. So that's one way to deplete the seed source is by letting them grow up and then burn them down, letting them grow up and then burn them down. Same thing with the honeysuckle. Um, it's best done in the springtime where the ground is a little bit more moist and when the leaves are first coming out so that you can grab as much of the energy of the plant as possible. It's trying to send out all of its nutrients up into the stems so you can kill it at that point. It works for shrubs and seedlings, um, but again, you have to do it on a regular basis. Barberry, uh, there's two ways to deal with the barberry. You can just cut down all of the stems of the barberry and then burn those, or you can do a controlled burn, prescribed fire in the, if you have a, um, like a, that field area that was just loaded with nothing but barberry. Um, they recommend to do it in early spring or late fall to kill the seedlings. And that's because at that point, a lot of the native plants are still dormant and um, you'll be less likely to harm the soil nearby that would be affecting a lot of the other plants. Um, the only time I've ever used burning has been to take plants that I've dried and then and I've dried them in a in a bag for like a whole season. So I knew that they were dead. The whole plant leaf, the leaves, the root systems, and the seeds and the stems, and put them into my wood stove and left the ashes in the wood stove for a few more days. And by the time everything was all burned up, I had this really, really fine powder. There was no signs of any parts of the plants left. Uh, and then I knew that they were officially gone. Um, burning, because of a lot of the things that are happening out west, is a topic of discussion specifically for invasive plants. This document, it's about 50 pages long, but if you are at all interested in learning about controlled burns for invasive plants, I urge you to uh, read that document at some other point. Um, Prescribed fires and burns are uh, a heated, well, I won't say heated, but a sensitive topic because of the fact that wherever you have the fire, if it's outdoors on the ground, there might be other species that are trying to grow there that uh, won't survive the fire. Uh, also, you're altering the landscape by burning an area. You're creating an open space, a disturbed place that invasives like to grow. So by burning there, you have to be really cautious that you're not creating an environment where more invasives will invade. As far as burning um, at a solid waste facility, that's a Tara question, and I'm going to um, defer to her for that part. Um, a lot of people will try the hand pulling or say, well, the bushes are too big. I don't have the time. I'm just going to mow it. I'm just going to cut it down. I'm gonna to try to girdle it. So what are my options here? If you wanna just mow it down, um, kind of shred it down, um, best time of year obviously is before it, the plant starts to flower and set seed. You can do it while the plant is flowering as long as it hasn't formed a, a seed yet because you don't want the, any of the seeds, whether they're immature or not, on the ground. While a plant is flowering, this goes for any plant, when a plant is flowering, it's using up a lot of its resources to form the flower and then form the seed. So that's when a plant is most vulnerable uh, and at greatest risk for death if you do something to it. So if you purposely want to kill a plant, wait until it's flowering and about to go to seed. Okay. So um, burning bush, knotweed, honeysuckle, and autumn olive all um, have been mowed and cut down. Um, and and um, that seems to work really well. I'm gonna talk about chemicals in a minute, but with autumn olive, after it gets cut down, some people use triclopyr ester, which is a chemical in some of the herbicide products. And they apply that to the cut stump to help prevent the autumn olive from creating new suckers and, continu and, and uh, continuing to grow. If you mow down the barberry, 
Again, you want to mow it before it produces the fruit. And if you want to just cut the stumps, the best time to cut the stumps is August to October. And why at that time of year? Because you are preventing any of the energy that the plant is making from going back down into the root system before the plant goes dormant. So what that does is um, you're starving the plant out. All it has to live on the entire winter is what is already in its root system. When you uh, mow or cut buckthorn, it's recommended that you cover the stem to keep the stem from wanting to sprout. And you can do that with plastic. Some people just take a tin can and put it over the top of the stump if it's big enough. Um, again, you want to keep the new growth from coming back. Multiflora rose and bittersweet. Um, because they're such prolific growers, you need to devote time if you're going to mow them or cut them to cut them three to as much as six times per growing season and do that for um, at least two, three, maybe even four years in a row before you're really going to start to see a difference. Because what you're trying to do is weaken those uh, plants by repeatedly cutting them so they can't make any more energy. All they have is what's left in the roots that they keep using up. And then also any of the seed bank that's left will keep sprouting and you keep cutting those down. So it's just, you're wearing it down, you're wearing it down. That's a lot of time to devote. And then girdling is another technique that foresters used back in the 1930s, 1940s on white pine when it had blister rust. They didn't have enough time to cut down every tree that was diseased. So they learned that if they girdled it, it'll just die on its own and they don't have to worry about it. Um, girdling is still used in forestry and it's also being used now for invasive species. So if you have a stem that's pretty large, and you want to uh, kill that plant, but maybe you can't cut it down because there are other plants growing right around it. Uh, you don't want to damage them or kill them. What you can do is on the main stem is you make a cut and a few inches above or below that cut, you make a second cut. And what you want to do is you want to cut all the way around the stem. So you go all the way around it, but you cut deep enough that you go past the bark and then the, uh, the coating that's right underneath the bark. On some of these, it might be light yellow, like on the buckthorn. Um, it might be bright white, but you go past that uh, layer underneath the bark, the inner bark, down into the woody piece, all the way around the entire stem. And you do two cuts because if one cut wasn't deep enough, it might heal over in one little tiny place and allow all of the nutrients to go up and down the stem again and the plant will still survive. If you make two cuts that deep, what's gonna happen is the um, energy from the leaves and the photosynthesis are blocked from going down to the roots and the energy from the roots are blocked from going up into the plant. And within one, two, as many as five years, depending on the size of the plant, you'll find that the plant is dead. So that is a, um, cost-effective way if you have larger plants and you can't do the mowing, you can't do the, um, the cutting, the chemicals, um, and you don't, obviously you can't pull it out or dig it out. That is another method that you can try. All right, chemicals. So what do we do about chemicals? Some people are really opposed to chemicals. Some people love the chemicals. Some people are, uh, you know, not sure, should I use them or not? You know, what are the long-term, you know, we hear about glyphosate and all these other ones on the news all the time, commercials on TV. There are three chemicals that are most, um, most used in invasive species work. One of them is glyphosate. And it's the chemical, not the brand name. The brand names are, are Cord, Rodeo, and Roundup. Over on the side, there's resources for all of these if you want some more specific information. But glyphosate is a chemical um, that can be used for cutting when you cut the stump and you want to um, dab it onto the stump, um, or you want to use a foliar spray and actually spray all the greenery on the plant. Glyphosate has been approved for that. Um, um, Amazapir is another one that's been approved for foliage. 
And then triclopyr, there's two different versions of it. Triclopyr amine, which um, the garlon A and the brush be gone for cutting the stump in the green foliage like the glyphosate. But the triclopyr ester um, can also be used for basal bark uh, applications. And the ester itself is a surfactant that um, gets added to the triclopyr so that the chemical will stick better to the, um, like in this particular situation, to the foliage. If you have a plant that the leaves are, are a little bit waxy on the surface, then a lot of these chemicals, um, which are some of them are water-based, are not going to stick. They're just going to run off and you can't control where it goes. Whereas if it has the ester in it, or in the old days it had the diesel fuel in it, it would stick to the foliage, suffocate the leaves, and then it would die. Um, so uh, there's two versions of that triclopyr. Now, the glyphosate and the amazapyr are considered non-selective uh, chemicals, meaning that they kill everything that they touch. They'll kill everything that's there. The uh, triclopyr amine is safe to use in a wetland when it's, you're painting it onto a cut surface. And also glyphosate pro is another version that can be used in wetlands that can be applied by a licensed herbicide or pesticide applicator. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the ester formulation uh, helps it stick to the foliage. But the other thing is that it's long lasting and it stays in the plant until the plant is dead. So foliar applications, you are spraying the foliage and the purpose is to prevent photosynthesis. So the plant cannot make any new food. It uses up all its reserves from the root system and hopefully you weaken it and eventually you can kill it. It can be used with burning bush using the glyphosate or the amazapyr in early summer. Um, honeysuckle when the leaves are green, so basically throughout the season because it's always growing. The multiflora rose in the autumn olive um, suggested uh, mid to late summer through early fall. Again, you're trying to starve the plant out before it goes dormant. Barberry in the fall after the natives have shed their leaves because the barberry is a lower growing shrub and it's in with a lot of other plants. Typically, you don't want to spray the barberry with those little tiny leaves and miss and get some of the other native plants. So after they've shed their leaves, it's safe to do the barberry. And then the buckthorn and the bittersweet, um, except the foliar applications on the bittersweet vine are not as effective as cutting the vine off and then treating the stump. So the cut stems and stumps, let's say that you mowed or you just went around with clippers and you cut all these shrubs down and now you've got these stems and stumps left. If you wanna treat them with an herbicide, you have to treat with the herbicide immediately after you make the cut because once the wood starts to dry out on the top of that stem, it won't. the chemical will not penetrate that wood. It's like it's already starting to heal over. It works for autumn olive and honeysuckle. It works for bittersweet and burning bush, except not in the early spring, because they're so prolific at that point, um, still sending out energy through the stem. Uh, multiflora rose and barberry, mid to late summer through uh, early fall. And then buckthorn again, best in October after the first frost when all the native plants have gone dormant. Again, the invasives have not gone dormant at the same time that our native plants have because they're the last ones to still have leaves. Um, the purpose of the cut stem treatment with the herbicide is you cut off the, you cut off the heads of the plants. They're not making any more food. All they have are their reserves, but now they're going to suck down the herbicide on their stem down into their root system thinking that it's more food coming from their head that they no longer have on top. And they're gonna suck down that poison and then they're gonna die. So that's how the cut stem and stump works. It's considered highly effective if it's done right. Um, any of these chemicals, if you're using them, if you choose to use them at your facility or at your home, whatever, it's recommended 
you know, not only read the label very carefully because don't mix and match. Uh, well, I'll just add this and that together or I'll make it a little more concentrated. These chemicals you have to use in the way that they're prescribed and you want to make sure that it's on a calm day where the wind is like 10 miles an hour or less because they're very easy to blow around. You want to wear protective gear for your eyes. You don't want to be inhaling. Um, and um, you want to make sure that um, you're applying it in the manner that it was specified. So if it says for cut stump, apply it to the stump. Don't be um, you know, sticking it in other places. Do it exactly the way that it um, has been described. Um, you also want to make sure that it's when the, it's a dry season because if it rains within the next 24 hours, it's possible that the shrub has not absorbed the chemical and the, the rain will just wash it off and then you've just wasted your money and your time. Another form of treatment is basal bark treatment. And what that entails is you are um, looking at a stem that's less than six inches in diameter and you are actually killing the base of or trunk of the plant. And so it works for autumn olive and barberry and bittersweet. The triclopyr seems to be the favored one, um, especially with the triclopyr ester. It works with um, burning bush during dormant seasons and even um, summertime with the burning bush. And again, it's mostly before um, fruiting season. And then honeysuckle, again, the triclopyr or triclopyr plus amazapyr in the winter or spring before it starts to leaf out again, because you're trying to get at the root where all of the, uh, where all of its, um, where all of its energy is and all of its carb storage. The other um, method, which is not used a whole lot because it's primarily for low, larger and older specimens, is a fill and drill technique. And that's where you actually put holes into the trunk and you put in a liquid um, herbicide into the trunk so that it takes that liquid and it goes up and down the tree and kills the tree from the inside out. Another form of that are actually injections of little pellets of the chemical, and which will do the same thing. It will ingest fat slowly. Um, it's advised that you need one hole if, for each uh, inch in diameter. So if you had a trunk that was six inches in diameter, you'd drill six holes around that stump to either um, inject with liquid or with the little pellets. So that can be really, really costly and it can partially be time consuming. It's primarily used with uh, buckthorn and honeysuckle on really big old stems. And you'll probably find it mostly with um, old homesteads, uh, historical places that have this huge, large, beautiful specimen of the European honeysuckle, but they've decided, you know, uh, it's really, you know, ethically, it's not good to have this in this environment anymore, but we have all these other mature plants around it. We don't want to kill them out. So we're gonna to have to use the fill and drill technique. So just so that you know, that is an option. So those are most of the ways that people choose to uh, remove invasive species on the landscape. I do wanna remind you that not all biological invasions, invasive species respond equally to that same treatment. So what works for buckthorn may not work for multi-flora rows at your facility at the same time for other reasons. Multiple treatments and mixed methods might be needed to control and eradicate an invasive species population. And I think most people will agree, as I said earlier, that yes, you do have to do multiple treatments, uh, mixed methods, and it's an ongoing process once you start to deal with these plants. Again, if you prioritize your control measures, starting with the small and manageable populations first, um, those that might be easier for you or more cost effective um, based on uh, the time, time of the season, uh, the, the human power that you have, et cetera. Um, the goal, again, is to stop the plants from producing fruits and seeds and to exhaust the seed bed that's already there. So those are the, those are, that, that's the goal, and, um, and I know you can do it. Um, 
Tara, do we want to take questions before we go into a review, or do you want to do the review first? Um, well, I have a question for you. Remember, we have the true and false questions. Do you want to do those first, or do you want to do these questions first? Okay, so let's do the true and false. We'll do the true and false. Um, yes, we'll do the true and false first. And actually, that might actually spar some questions from there. So that's a good place to go. Exactly. I couldn't remember which one we had decided. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so our first poll question, all non-native upland plants are invasive, true or false? People are voting quick. Wow, they already yeah. know this material. Well, I'm not saying that they're necessarily right. It was just they were. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, we got 93% in 30 seconds. That's awesome. All right, so I'm going to close and share. So we got 56% of the people said true and 44% said false. So Janine, what is our answer? All non-native in all non-native plants are not, it is not true that all <laughs> non-native plants are invasive. It is not true that all non-native plants are invasive. Uh, some non-native plants can be invasive in your particular garden because they just grow all over the place and you might consider them invasive. But for the legal definition of invasive species, uh, according to that definition at the very beginning from New Hampshire, an invasive species causes economic or ecological harm or harm to human health. And to fit the legal definition, not all non-native species are invasive. Correct. So remember, we've got that alien species and then the invasive. Correct. An apple tree is non-native and it's really not invasive. Uh, the mulberry tree is not native and in some places it can all of a sudden become almost invasive it starts to pop up because of the birds and you start seeing mulberry trees where you never planted them so it can have an invasive habit but it's not still even though it's propagating elsewhere like bee balm it just kind of spreads everywhere it's not harming the environment to the point where it's considered an invasive species excellent all right next one is Plants listed as invasive in New Hampshire have no natural predators or diseases to keep their populations under control. True or false? Guys, a few more seconds. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share. So we had 78% said true and 22% said false. So what is the answer? Plants listed as invasive species. I lost the question there because I Whoops. can't read it. All right, um, there you go. Plants listed as invasive species in New Hampshire. Oh, wait a minute. I can extend my screen. It's not making it any bigger. Um, you want me to do read it not, do not. Okay, so plants that are listed on the invasive species list, they do not have native, natural predators, diseases, and insects that can keep their populations under control. And that's part of the problem. Yep, so it is true. Correct. All right, and the next one, we've got three more for this portion. No one in New Hampshire is permitted to transport prohibited species for disposal. True or false? They're all over the place with this one. <laughs> <laughs> And once we cl close this one out, I'll leave it up so you can see it. All right, so we have everybody voted. 
And so we have 71% said false and 29% said true. And the question was, no one in New Hampshire is permitted to transport prohibited species for disposal. Okay, and the key word there is disposal. So the answer is false. Under the exemption, if you are collecting and transporting an invasive species specifically for the purpose of disposal, you are allowed to do that in New Hampshire, provided that you can guarantee that no plant parts um, escape while you are transporting it to the place of disposal. And we will go over the disposal and the rules the so that regards to solid waste in a few minutes. All right, so some products containing glyphosate or triglycerides yeah. are safe to use in wetlands, true or false? <clears throat> They're mixed on this one. I'm watching the ticker. <laughs> I feel like we need a little Jeopardy uh, clock sound there. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share this. So 43% tr said true and 57% said false. Um, and again, the question was some products containing glyphosate or that other T word I can't say are safe to use in wetlands. And the answer is true. And maybe the question is, should be, it would be easier to um, make that decision if it said for wetland applications. Uh, ah. you're, not dumping, you're not dumping the chemical in the wetlands specifically, but um, you know, there are times where you have um, buckthorn. There was, a, again, another application that went through the uh, USDA NRCS program where the landowner was granted some money to get rid of buckthorn in a wetland and it was growing right along the edges and out into the water. And again, it was a, a mowing operation where you had to cut and dab um, each stem with the chemical. And they could have used the glyphosate pro or they could have used one of the triclopyrs that is uh, allowed to be used. It's, um, it's written for use in wetland applications. So the answer is true. There are some that do exist for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think another clarify, a part of this is it says some products. Correct. So we're not saying all, there are some, and it's a very... And it doesn't mean narrow. you still want to use it, but I mean, right. it is, you know, they are licensed for that use. Correct. Correct. It might not be your best option, but... Mm -hmm. Okay. And the last true or false question, foliar, spray, foliar sprays can be applied at any time during the year without danger to nearby native vegetation. True or false? They're coming in hot and heavy on this one. Seconds. Okay. So we got 89% said false and 11% said true. And the question again is foliar sprays can be applied at any time during the year without danger to nearby vegetation. And the answer is I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is false. There's no way that you can guarantee at any time during the year um, that you're not going to endanger other plants um, because you are spraying. You, and so that's why a lot of the foliar sprays, it's recommended that you wait uh, until the normal, the uh, native plants have lost their leaves so that when you're spraying the leaves, you're not spraying native leaves, you're spraying just the invasive leaves. There are some times a year where it's recommended more than other depending on the plant and depending on the chemical, but overall, you cannot guarantee that a foliar spray at any time of year will not endanger a native plant. Okay, so we do have a question that came in, Janine. It mm -hmm. says, 
um, can dish soap and salt kill any of the invasive species instead of using chemicals? And also I heard that miracle Grow only used once that the salt will kill the plant. Okay, so let me do the dish soap first. Um, the dish soap would be coating the leaves until it rains or until we get a heavy dew. And the salt will get into the soil and kill the roots. And that's the theory behind that. Um, miracle grow, either you're using a lot to overstimulate the growth of the plant or you're using it to add more salts to the soil because repeated use of miracle grow adds a lot of salts to the soil, which also will kill a plant. Both of those systems, salt-based, will take several years. So if you want to try um, putting a lot of salt into your soil, you can try it. But remember, um, the, a lot of the plants that you see growing along the edges of the road, including Japanese knotweed, are salt tolerant. These plants are highly adaptable to different soil types, to the different pHs, to a lot of the potassium, the calcium, and the salts that are in the soil. So you might just be wasting your time. If you think you want to try a, an all natural way to go, I applaud you for that, number one. But number two, do a little bit more research. Find people that have actually tried it. I've not done that. Uh, once I saw what Miracle Grow can do to a garden being used repeatedly um, and how the plants all of a sudden, you know, the first couple of years, they're, oh, they're beautiful. They look like they're on steroids. And next thing you know, they're all dying. I don't want to do that to the, to the soil. So um, I, won't, I won't go the route of assault, but that's, that's just me personally. So um, I just recommend a little bit more research on that. And just remember that a lot of these plants are salt tolerant. So that was a good question. That's it for questions for right now. So you've got a couple questions for them. Okay, so yes, moving right along. Um, why are some plants considered invasive under New Hampshire rules? So you guys can either type in or if you wanna raise your hand and, and verbally say it, that's fine. Seconds. What is it about one of these plants that it's considered invasive in New Hampshire? Oh, go back somebody. to that definition. We have an answer? Yep, they damage the environment is one answer. Ding, 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 ding. And I have one, there's no natural. Oh, oh, wait a minute, we got, wait a minute, we got a hand up. <laughs> Hold, on. Hold on. All right, whose hand is up? Oh, the hand went down. Oh, okay. Wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Wayne, Wayne, Wayne McBrien. If you would like to tell us an answer, feel free. Or if you have a question, go ahead. You're unmuted, Wayne. Can't hear you. Uh oh. You may have to type in your question. Your device may not be connected. All right. So Wayne, while you're trying to figure that out, I'll send you a quick chat and see. Okay, so we'll move on to number two while we're waiting and go back to Wayne's answer. Oh, wait a minute. Someone just typed in harmful to humans. Yes, that's another that's another consideration. Mm -hmm. So they're harmful to the environment and they're harmful to humans, and they could pose economic um, stressors or economic harm. And when you think about economic harm is we have to spend a lot of time and money uh, to eradicate these plants that at one time we thought were great for conservation reasons. Okay, so <clears throat> number two, how might the presence of invasive plant species impact our native communities? How might their presence in these native communities harm them? 
So we got a comment, they outcompete the natives. And that is the biggest takeaway right there. That's the biggest takeaway. They just take over everything. Are there any other comments? Um, I got take over and wipe out. Um, I did hear from Wayne. His he he his device doesn't have a microphone, so he's like, I can't. It's an okay. <laughs> Thank you. Good for answering. <laughs> Sorry, Wayne. <laughs> I applaud you for raising your hand and attempting. <laughs> Oh, okay. Okay, some of, some of the other ways that um, besides they take over and they outcompete and they um, they smother out and they you know prevent other trees from growing and other plants from growing, they also um, can alter the soil chemistry. They can also change the temperature. There's a lot of things that they can do below ground that um, some of them we may not even be aware of. They also suck up a lot of the nutrients. Um, and they change the the um, canopy. When they grow, you know, 10 feet tall, 30 feet tall, they're creating shade in an area where there may not normally have been shade, and that will also affect plants. Okay, so number three, what are five invasive species that might be disposed of at your solid waste facility or become established at your solid waste facility? I'm going to give people 30 seconds to answer that. I need to, I, there's something going on in the other, hold on one second. I'll be right back, but I'll let people. In. And everybody should be able to come up with five quickly and easily. So name five species that we've talked about today. So remember, you guys took screenshots. So we've got bittersweet, Japanese knotweed, honeysuckle, barberry, buckthorn, um, burning bush is coming in. And then there's one I can't read the whole thing. Multiflora rose. That was the one that got me. I was like, oh, what's that? And there's um, a lot of others that, um, that we didn't even talk about today or that I mentioned as an aside that can go on that list because there's 35 listed on, on New Hampshire's website. That is a lot. Yeah. Okay. So the last, the last, oh, wait, what, okay. One of them that came through, through was winged, winged something. The second word, it says euanimous, winged. The winged euanimous. Yeah. That's the burning bush. Oh, okay. Okay. Same yeah, thing. that's another name for it. Um, got it, got it. That was from yeah, Wayne. So, yeah, we got, because of those those four little things on the side, they, they're also um, thought of as wings. Oh, and black swallow? Black swallow tail, um, is it black swallow wart? Black swallow yep. wart, there's two swallow warts um, that are also highly invasive. I've yet not personally experienced them, um, but I do know a forester that has it on his property, and he says it's really hard to get rid of. Uh, that's more of an herbaceous plant, but yes, that's okay. another one. All right, cool. Um, it may not end up at the solid waste facility because it's herbaceous. It might be something they throw in the compost pile, not thinking about it. But if they know, if people know what it is, they might put it in a bag and take it there. So that's a good answer as well. Okay, um, okay so last question. Can you name three methods for managing invasive species? And what are they? Yeah, we'll do that one, yep. Yeah. Second to type. I got mechanical, biological, and chemical. Great. Okay. Burning, so mowing, learned... chemical. Yeah, <laughs> they're coming in. <laughs> yep. So you've all learned a lot. <laughs> Yes. This is great. Uh, and that was the purpose is to give you a really broad understanding of what's going on out there relating to invasive species um, and also provide you with some URLs for some information that you can go to and learn more on your own so that this topic of invasive species is not so scary um, because there's just so much, you know, there's a lot of legislation involved and uh, there's just a lot of things to have to know. 
So um, one of the things that I want to suggest to you is the three Ds of disposal. The first one is to make sure that you dry the plants and the roots completely to prevent regrowth when you're pulling them. You can actually hang them upside down in the um, arched branch, you know, in the, in the branches of the tree, like the V and the, the U forks of the trees. Uh, that was something that was done during the blister rust control program when the gooseberries and currants were being pulled up all over the state. They just hung them from the trees. And then over the time, the plant would completely dry out and then it would just eventually rot and it was gone. No more gooseberry or currant. D for double bag, or you can burn the seeds. In New Hampshire, you can actually dispose of the seeds if they're double bagged at the landfill. Tara is going to go more into detail on that. Um, and the final D is do not put invasives onto the compost pile or the brush pile because you cannot guarantee that the plant is dead, that it won't re-sprout, and that the seeds won't be viable and continue to grow. So those are the three Ds. Uh, these resources are in the PDF of um, places that you can go for more information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tara to talk about uh, the management piece, um, the rules regarding the actual uh, solid waste facility and the landfill. Yes, and um, also that slide that, that Janine just put up with the with the URLs, that is also in my presentation at the end. So if you didn't grab a snapshot, I'll put it up again. You grab a snapshot, it also will go up online. So you'll have um, all of that information as you need it. So I want to make sure that you guys can see the right slides and get myself settled. All right, so Janine, thank you so much for going over all of that because that is going to make my job really easy. I'm going to work with you guys and tell you how, what the rules are regarding invasive upland plants at solid waste facilities. Um, she, Janine gave us a rundown on what we need to be looking for in regards to the species and what we need to do to mitigate the spread. And my job is to take everything Janine has given us and incorporate that into the laws and rules that are specific to solid waste facilities. Um, and then basically I will be offering you some do's, don'ts, and really don't even think about it, depending on the type of facility that we are discussing. Don't worry, I am not going to dive into rule citations and law citations. I'm going to try to give you true application on what you're doing. And if you need to dig into the rules more specifically, we can discuss those things um, offline. The points I'm going to dive into are rules regarding leaf and yard waste bans. Remember that. Me methods of managing that may disrupt the cap. So we're talking landfills here. So, and when I say cap, I also mean cover. So many of the closed landfills, they don't necessarily have a cap. They have covers. Uh, we're going to talk about chemical and physical treatment. Uh, what to do if it's growing at your facility. And this is... Um, at an active facility, whether it's a transfer station, scrap metal yard, uh, landfill, at your active facility. And then my favorite thing, operating plans. You guys know we've been pushing and pushing and pushing these operating plans and making sure that they are up to date for your facility. We want to give you the tools so that you can manage your facility appropriately and effectively. All right. So quick 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 slide here this the t this is reviewing again the methods of managing invasive species you've got your biological controls um, they use plant diseases or insect predator predators you've got mechanical control methods pulling digging suffocation cutting mowing girdling uh, there's chemical controls there's cultural controls um, and when you put all of these together and you, you can start looking at site and determining what is the best way to manage invasives and along with other pests at your facility, you're going to create an integrated pest management plan that's specific to your site. Again, tie it in with that operating plan. It's specific to your site. Um, and this whole integrated pest management, we may be able to do another class on that. But for now, we're just going to be talking about upland invasives. First thing I want to mention is invasive species are not considered in the definition of leaf and yard waste. 
For those of you that remember back from basic training, there is a statutory ban on disposal of leaf and yard waste in landfills and incinerators. And the reason is, is because it takes up space in the landfill. There's no reason to manage it in that way, leaf and yard waste. Yard waste is also defined as leaves, grass clippings, garden debris, and smaller chip branches. Now, the Solid Waste Management Bureau at DES does not consider invasive species to be leaf and yard waste. They are considered to be municipal solid waste. Therefore, landfills and incinerators may accept invasive species for disposal. Important to remember, just because we allow it at DES does not mean that your destination facility will accept it. So you may want to check with them to make sure that they will accept those invasive species or even just notify them, hey, we got a load of invasive species in, we're putting it in with our MSW or in for incineration, for, for landfill or incineration, we're sending it to you. So you can let them know you've already checked it, you know it can't, it's not supposed to go in your compost pile or leaf and yard waste pile and go from there. All right. So Landfills. Let's talk about managing of invasive plants growing at active and inactive landfills. This is, remember, specific to your landfills. Digging. Digging down and pulling out those roots. So basically disturbing the cap or the cover. You've got a couple of different things going on here. For a closed landfill, an inactive landfill, you can only hand dig six inches or less. If whatever plant's growing, um, say it's a Japanese knotweed, and you're like, well, Tara, we know those roots grow down feet. You need to contact DES. You need to contact DES and work with your consultant to figure out how you're going to remove that specific species. I'm telling you right now, you're not going to want to get out there with machinery to dig that out and dig into the waste that is there because then you're disturbing the cap and you don't want to do it. Now, for an active landfill, if on your intermediate cover, operating plan, hello? So this should be in your operating plan. You need to go back to your operating plan and see what it says that's in there. If you don't have it in there, that's when you contact DES and say, okay, we need some assistance on this. We need to help. We need help figuring out how we're going to get this invasive species out here that meets the rules and the requirements. Um, and then the same as the active face operating plan. It should already be in there. You guys should already have that plan in place. And then you'll see this banner on the bottom of this slide. You'll see it a lot in the next couple slides. Regardless of the situation, if you have invasive species growing at and on your landfill, you need to contact your consultant. They are there to help you and to assist you on management and what is the best management for whatever specific invasive species is growing there. All right, chemical treatment. Well, chemical treatment may not be our first go-to. Sometimes it is a necessary evil. And when applied in accordance with the label, it can be quite effective and minimally harmful. And Janine already went over all of that with you. So think about it this way, that you're, you're, if you are at that point where this is the only thing you can do, then this is what we gotta do. For plants growing on a closed landfill, the best option may be to apply locally to the plant. Make sure, you're, again, you're following the instructions on the container. For those of you that have an active landfill and are mitigating plants on your cover, which you should not have there anyways. What does your operating plan say again? Oh, operating plan. There should be something in there. If not, again, work with your consultant and then check with DES to determine it if it is allowable. Now, lastly, this goes for any of your facilities. If there are impacts to groundwaters and surface water, you don't wanna use those chemicals. You're gonna to have to check with your other um, permits that you have at your facility, your groundwater monitoring plan, see if whatever it is that you are wanting to do is allowable. Now, again, check with your consultants. You guys are paying your consultants to manage those closed landfills and the active landfills. You all have consultants that manage the permits. 
You pay them to do the monitoring. They have the tools and the expertise to follow all of the regulations as well as the conditions in your permit. If you have stormwater swales in your, on your closed landfill and you have invasives growing in those swales and the only way you can get them out of there is through chemical treatment, you're going to want to talk with your consultant for application, proper application and licensed application. Don't take it upon yourself to go out there and say, okay, I'm going to use the chemicals. I'm going to spray it on there because you don't know what's going to happen and what's going to come down the pike on you. All right. So those are the two biggies. Grazing. You want to get some goats out there? Sure. You can do that. That is allowable. But there's a couple things you might want to do first. You're going to want to check with some experts on invasives like Janine. There may be some reason that specific plants should not be grazed on, um, whether it's the time of year, if they have seeds on them and the, the, the um, goats come and they defecate elsewhere and then the seeds are spread even more. So there's certain things you just need to know. You need to look into, you need to research time of year, types of animals, types of plants, or you may get goats out there and they're like, I don't like that plant. So they're not going to eat it. So there's no sense in having the goats come out there. And then just check in with DES and just say, hey, this is what we're doing. This is a um, either post-closure activity or it is an activity that we're going to be doing at our landfill. Is this allowable? 90% of the time, sure. You want to bring goats out there? Great. That's what they're doing. Wonderful. Um, you're managing and mitigating plants that are invasive. Smothering and desiccation. So it's basic physical in situ treatment. It's fine. Again, with the landfills, you need to make sure if you're putting down that plastic cover, you're not taking stakes and putting stakes down in because it could punch the cap or cover of your landfill. Also, you need to make sure that if it is an active landfill, the intermediate cover or active face is not negatively affected at all by putting that plastic down. You can't create an issue while trying to clean up another issue. You need to make sure that your stormwater console controls are not impeded. And we get this a lot. Don't cover the vents. The vents are there for a purpose. You need to be mindful of the area that is around you that you are wanting to cover. You don't want to negatively affect the landfill features and apparatus that are already there. You are going to be the least amount of, um, affected the least amount and to remove those plants. Okay, physical alteration. So we talk mowing, cutting, girdling. Yes, yes, yes. You know, on a landfill, on the, the cl closed landfills, you need to mow that. You, you have to mow that down. So if your part of your invasives um, plan is to mow it, great. You want to cut it down. As long as you're using the proper safety um, gear and safety measures, go for it. Girdling. The only thing I want to say about that is you need to make sure that if you are going to girdle, that you are doing it at the proper time of year and on plants where it will make a difference. And that, again, is going to just you need to do some research about what plants you have there and what the best options are. But physical alterations. Go for it. Burning. Just say no. You may not open burn on or in your landfill. You do not want to catch the landfill on fire. You don't know what's in that landfill, especially those closed landfills. Do not burn on the landfill. And I will just leave you with that. Does anyone have any questions regarding what you can and cannot do at a active or inactive landfill in regards to management of these plants? You can raise your hand or you could type your question. I'll give you a few seconds. Not seeing anything. All right. So let's talk about active facilities. These, and we're talking about the non landfills. These uh, landfills no longer we're talking about. Um, you want to, the management of invasive upland plants either growing at the facility or disposed of at the facility. We're gonna make this very easy. You may wanna screenshot this picture, but it basically goes through each thing and says, yes, no, whatever. 
So composting. Stop. When we're talking composting here, we're talking especially, well, we're talking about any kind of composting in your facility, including leaf and yard waste piles. When your customers bring you a plant and bring in their leaf and yard waste, you have no idea if that plant is completely dead or not. You just don't. You don't know how long they've had it, if they bagged it up, if they just pulled it out of the ground that day. Um, you also know for a fact that 95% of your residents and customers are not going to go through and cut off all the flowers and the fruits and bag them up and then bring you the leaf and yard waste separately. They're just not going to do it. People just, that's not what they're going to do. So don't compost invasive species. All right. So yes, shallow digging and hand pulling. Sure. As long as you're using dig safe controls and you're out of the footprint of the landfill and you know what you're doing when you pull those out. Um, desiccation or smothering. Again, as long as you're not impeding normal operations or creating a stormwater um, collection point. You don't want to do that either. Um, mowing and cutting, go for it. As long as you're following the safety controls of the facility, that's fine. So your maybes. So your burn pile. This one, I went, kind of went back and forth with myself and kind of talked to Janine about it. And so really with the burn pile, you don't want to put it in there, but if it ends up in there, you, the plant has to be completely dead. Roots, everything. And then the flowers and the fruits removed. You do not want those going through that burn pile because you don't know if it's going to be, if it's, it may come out of the other end viable and then you're in a world of hurt. Um, so just if you, if you notice them in the burn pile, you can yank them out and put them in with the MSW. Chemical treatment. Um, if they've come in and someone has brought them to you already pulled out of the ground, there's, you don't need to chemically treat those. Just put those in a bag and put them in the, in the MSW. Um, for chemical treating ones that are growing on site, again, you want to follow all of the, the label instructions. You also want to review your permits. So if you've got groundwater monitoring on site, if you've got wetlands nearby, if you have drinking water wells nearby, some of you may, you need to make sure that if you are chemically treating these, that you are doing it in accordance with all of the permits and then your labels. And I, every single facility is different. So you all will have something different that you have to adhere to. So these are the maybes. So the stop, go, and maybe. That's pretty simple and easy to follow along. Any questions? Hands raised. I know it's a lot of information. All right. Oh, operating plans. So we talk about operating plans in many of our classes. You guys know you all have to have an operating plan for your active facilities. So these are the three sections where invasive plant species may come into play. So you've got section two, section three, and section five. A lot of words, I understand. So section two is just your authorized and prohibited wastes. Is this waste listed as an authorized waste? Do you have this specifically listed in your operating plan? I would guess most of you are going to say, well, no. Remember, if you are authorized to take MSW, then you are authorized to take invasive species in and manage them properly. Um, for those of you who are not authorized to take MSW, then you need to consider this as a prohibited waste. So think about some there, we do have scrap metal. I always go back to scrap metal facilities because really they're permitted to take in scrap metal. That's it. They're not permitted to accept um, your invasive species. So for section two, you're gonna you're not gonna want to bring them in from your customers. However, you may find them on your site, and then we'll we'll talk about that in section five. All right. So for those of you who have said, "Yep, we are authorized to accept invasive waste," and we're I mean, yeah, invasive plant species as waste, and you are going to. 
in section three of your operating plan, all you do is lay out how you're going to handle it. So if you know you're going to accept them, what do you tell your customers? Where are they supposed to put the invasive species? How are they supposed to bring them to you? And be specific. So then when you have the new guy who comes in and someone brings them in invasives and they're like, have them in their hand. Hey, I've got some um, buckthorn here. What do I do with it? He can look in the operating plan and say, oh, this is what we do. Da, 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 done and done. And you're not running around trying to find answers or calling DES or doing any of that. You already know what your plan is. And then section five, this is for if you find invasives growing at your facility. This is your routine maintenance, inspections, and monitoring plan. So if you find it and you've identified it as growing at your facility, you need to implement a routine plan. What are you going to do to mitigate it? What makes the most sense? And that's where your integrated pest management plan could come into play. Um, so how are you going to just get rid of those plants from, or stop them from growing at your facility? And then the plants that you've gotten out of the ground, what are you going to do with them? And that all needs to be in your operating plan. So that is a quick and dirty what you have to do at solid waste facilities. So Janine sets you up with telling you what all the invasives were and what your options are, and then I linked those with what you have to do at your solid waste facility. And then as promised, here is the resources page again. Um, Janine and I do have a couple of questions to add, more poll questions to, to gauge what you've learned. But if you guys have questions, we have another 10 minutes or so um, of time available. If you have questions, you can feel free to type those in. You can chat them in. You can raise your hand and I can unmute you. And if you have a microphone, you can talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I've got the poll questions. So I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to do to screenshot these resources. Oh, and I can see I screwed up this slide. I apologize. I did not take off all the things in the bottom. Just ignore those. And we will do those poll questions. Janine, do you have any questions with what I went over? Okay. Mm -mm. I'm not seeing any come in. So, all right. I'm going to throw out the first. So these are the same questions that we asked you in the very beginning of the workshop, and we'll give you the answers now. So the first question is, the following are upland plant invasive species found in New Hampshire. And the choices are Japanese knotweed, milfoil, burning bush, barberry, and wisteria. I'll give you guys a few seconds. It's taking a little longer. You got 10 more seconds. All right. So Janine, of this list, which one is not an invasive upland species? Can you see the list? Oh. Hello? Oh. It was uh -oh. on and then it went off. <laughs> uh oh. Um, the the milfoil is a wetland plant, so it is not an upland invasive species. The knotweed, burning bush, barberry, wisteria are all upland. They grow. They're all terrestrial plants. And then of course the wisteria grows taller than the other ones, uh, being a vine. Um, another one of those plants that has that vining habitat, we didn't talk about it specifically, but you can lump it in with the oriental bittersweet that it can take over, it crawls over, climbs over, whatever is in its way, um, sun and shade, and um, can actually girdle other plants. So everything but the milfoil is an upland invasive species. Perfect. Okay, so let me hunt that. All 
right. So which management method should you never do with an invasive species? Compost it, burn it, cover it in plastic, dig it up in chemical. Which one should you never do? These answers are better than the ones earlier, which is excellent. All right, so I'm gonna close and share. So we got 88% said compost it and 28% said burn it. Which one were we looking for? We're looking primarily for compost it. Um, and the reason is that you cannot um, be assured that when you compost something that it's number one, as Tara said, not completely dead already. Um, but that number two, that the seeds are that there it may still have seeds that are viable and you can continue to grow plants and suddenly your compost pile is covered in little seedlings of burning bush. So composting is um, not recommended. And then the burning is going to be an it depends kind of a situation. It's highly situational. Um, it's not allowed obviously um, in New Hampshire at sites that Tara was just talking about. Um, but if it was a uh, home use, like in a wood stove, I mean, that's, you know, you're still burning it. You're just doing it in a different way. So the burning, um, while it's not legally acceptable in New Hampshire, uh, could be used in other ways. So um, composting and burning are both correct answers, but the one that is, that tops it all is please do not compost invasive species. Yep. All right. And <clears throat> how do invasive species spread? Choose all that apply. You got seeds, nurseries, compost, incomplete burns. So seeds via vectors is 100%, absolutely. 67% of people said nurseries selling them as pretty plants. I'm wondering if people did not choose that one because nurseries are not supposed to be selling them. However, we all know that there are some people who don't necessarily follow the law. Um, and then you've got compost and incomplete burns, both at 89%. So all of the above? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I would definitely say all of the above on that. Perfect. All right, and this is our last poll question. Invasive species brought to a solid waste facility from a customer should be treated as leaf and yard waste, true or false? One hundred percent of people said false. Very good. <laughs> Yay! Perfect. <laughs> All right. So you guys still can see that resources slide if you want to take a screenshot, or it'll be up um, online later. You've got the handouts. There are the three in there. One is the um, the sign-in sheet, and then two are PDFs from um, Janine. There are a couple other people that put in a couple of different sites um, regarding cooperative extension. Mm -hmm. And I put one of them in the chat. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can also, you can always ask those in the um, out of the, the end of class survey that goes out. Um, I want to thank Janine very much for being with us today. Um, and before we let you go, does anybody else have any questions? Oh, I just got one. Oh, no, I got a comment. Great webinar. So if anybody else has any other questions, please speak now or forever hold your peace. Anybody else? Not seeing anything. So Janine, thank you very much. I will send you a um, 
uh, the surveys when they come in. I'll send you the results from that and, and send you an email. And I'm getting lots of people that are like, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So. <laughs> well, thank you. And thanks for having me here. It was fun to do this today. So great. And thank you, Donnie, for um, sending me your name because this was perfect. All right, guys, have a great day. Bye.